<clears throat> All right, welcome to the first ACAPUG meeting, Aries Cloud Agent Python user group meeting of 2024, January 8th, 9th. Whoops, mistake already. There we go. Um, topics today, we've got status updates on all sorts of things that are going on. <clears throat> we've got a uh, prep for our next meeting, which is an Akapai roadmap for 2024. Um, Patrick is going to give us a presentation on some W3C verifiable credential traceability test suite work that he's been doing that is just amazing and cool. Um, Lucas O'Neill is going to provide a presentation on an endorser service UI and that should take us to the end, but if there's any other time, we'll we'll go through any PRs issues people want to talk about or open discussion. Anything anyone wants to add to that list of topics? All right. <clears throat> Reminder that we are recording. Uh, that this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger Foundation call, so the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. A um, couple of announcements to make is the annual reports, and that you'll hear more when I talk about the roadmap, um, but <clears throat> Hyperledger requires now um, annual reports that uh, complement the quarterly reports, and so we're in the midst of preparing those for Aries and OnCreds in Indy for this community. And so um, those are, are being worked on in January and, and you'll be asked, everyone will be asked to contribute to those <clears throat> in the community. IIW is coming up in April and plans are starting to be made for that. Um, any other announcements or anyone that wants to introduce themselves? Looks like I recognize everyone on the call this time. So any any other announcements or anything people want to say? Patrick. Yeah, just uh, wanted to just mention. So over the holidays, um, I got a little visit from uh, Brian Richer from Digital Bazaar. And we uh, made a uh, proof of concept for adding to the VC playground an issuer uh, leveraging Akapai. Uh, so we got it working in the UI. So we managed to get the VC API exchange and a Didcom exchange. And uh, next on the list, I'm going to uh, have uh, set up the OIDC for VCI exchange. So we're looking at adding another sort of issuing uh, and verifying platform to the VC playground based on Akapai. So that's something we'll be working on in the next months. That sounds like a presentation for next meeting. Uh, maybe not next meeting, but uh, definitely uh, when, when we'll, when we'll uh, have it fully incorporated, I, I'd be uh, more than happy to. All right. For this, so. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. Um, Thank you. Any other any other comments at this time? That was pretty cool. All right. Um, status updates and on credits RS work is proceeding. Um, the and on credits. Um, this is the sorry. This is an on credits RS in Akapai. I should mention that. Um, uh, Ian, you've been off for a while, but you're back on it and meeting with, uh, Daniel, I believe today. Yep. This afternoon. Uh, okay. And to talk about next steps and plan that out. Um, next step is to get the endorser integrated in. So we've got that flow and we can, um, then fully use it. Then there's, um, other than that, it's the, how do we upgrade um, from using CredX to an on creds RS. So yeah, plus, plus just, just more testing. Yeah. And yeah, lots of that. Um, I don't see, yeah, we don't have, uh, either Daniel 
or Jason on, but did peer work? Uh, did peer two has been merged so we can both um, handle at any time received and emit a did peer two? There is a PR that is in final review for did peer four as well. Um, so both of those are um, nearing completion. Um, we're hoping we get enough time. Uh, Jason's going to have to go over to another project for a bit, but we're um, there's a possibility he might be able to get through the did rotate part. So that's a PR that's half uh, half done and um, hoping uh, he can uh, complete it. Should be fairly straightforward. Um, <clears throat> load generator testing is going on at BC Gov. Um, so we're, we've got areas of creator running. We've got an instance of things that we're testing against. Um, we did a re uh, first formal run through this morning and ran into some issues that we're going to investigate and uh, hopefully have a chat. Um, we're going to be talking with um, uh, Kim and the team on Thursday to learn more and then keep working on it. But we've got a fairly good setup for running formal tests on that. So we're looking forward to have a report to put out on that. Um, and on creds in W3C format, um, that is uh, proceeding along. The and on creds RS work is largely complete. We now have um, the final, or perhaps the sec, yeah, the final version of what um, the and on creds uh, is going to look like. And on creds uh, in W3C format, as far as the VC and the VP. Um, we did eliminate, for those who were sort of following along, we did eliminate any custom uh, or, or extra and non-creds context. So we're using pure W3C um, um, and data integrity proof um, context. So that's good. Um, we can, I believe we've got a switch that we can use to produce either 1.0 or 2.0 um, VC. 1.1 or 2.0 um, W3C BCs. Um, and now getting down to defining exactly how to integrate those two into Akapai and AFJ, which is the um, obviously the goal of, of the overall exercise. And <clears throat> finally, we've got a new item that is just starting up. Um, which is um, DIDCOM RPC support, which is driven off of this PR um, that is uh, has been submitted for ARIES RFC. So this basically is a request response protocol that um, uses um, JSON RPC which is a pretty straightforward um, to use and, and really good for the purposes we want it for. Um, uh, allows the sending of JSON our, uh, messages, a, a request message from a client to a server to say, hey, execute this JSON RPC. Um, and then um, a response back in the format of, of, a, of a JSON RPC response. Um, the idea here is that the ARIES agent, um, in our case, Akapai, would simply be the conveyor of the message, and it's expected the protocol itself would actually execute the um, JSON RPC itself. So um, ARIES is largely ignorant of what is going on as a result of the calls back and forth, um, but the... Uh, uh, the controller that is connected to um, a, a particular ARIES uh, Akapai instance or ARIES instance would um, take care of, of, of carrying out the work. Any questions or comments on all of those things? Lots going on. All right. Um, I won't take long on this one, um, but 
a preparation for next week, if people could start to, or, or next meeting, um, people could start to think about the Aries Cottage and Python roadmap for 2024. As mentioned, the annual report includes a roadmap component. Um, so the idea is we we do quarterly reports for all the projects in Hyperledger. Um, those um, are becoming fairly routine. We collect input and, and pass them on. What, what um, Hyperledger TOC has requested is that uh, in the first quarter uh, of each year, an annual report be provided that sort of says, here's what we accomplished against our roadmap for next year. But of course, we don't have a roadmap from last year, really. Um, so we'll talk about what's been accomplished, but then um, include a roadmap for 2024 of what we would like to see accomplished. So I'm currently working on the report and coordinating with others on that. Um, items that I see, and I throw this out just for conversation and to get people thinking about it in preparation for next time. Um, the current work that's listed above um, did rotate, um, which I did mention in did peer, but did rotate would lead to didcom v2. Um, so didcom v2, I think belongs here Potentially, um, I don't know enough about it, but the trust over P, trust over IP trust spanning layer, um, I, I don't know how it varies from Didcom V2 or or um, extends it, adjusts it. Um, I just don't know enough about it. So uh, we do need to take a look at that in the Aries community to see where that fits in and the timing of that. But certainly, um, being able to support didcom v2 i think is, is pretty key um did web s is a uh a new um uh did method uh that was um published over um the holidays in december um a draft is in review at trust over ip and it would be good to add support for that certainly something we're interested in doing um, obviously, always want improved documentation and tools. Um, a release 1.0 with LTS support, long-term uh, support, would be most useful and, and appropriate. And um, finally, uh, other possible things, a non-creds V2, depending on the progress, a non-creds itself, that project makes on a V2. Um, I know other VC types um, are going to be looked at, especially MDL and expanded credential exchange protocols. And we already heard from Patrick on that. Um, VC API, uh, open ID for VCs and so on. And, and generally more open ID for VC support. So those are the things that I just in a two minute thought, think through and um, going through a little mind map that I've got, uh, I came up with. So I would ask that people consider um, these things. I don't know if anyone has any comments right now of what they want to immediately see added to this, but um, just something to think about for the next meeting. Okay, with that, um, Patrick, are you ready to go? And I can stop sharing and turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, sure. All right. All right. Let me share my screen. Uh, right. So, yeah, I'm going to be presenting some work uh, I've been undergoing in the last uh, month, month and a half. But this also builds... Uh, on a lot of exploration I've been making between the sort of VC API specification on the W3C and the capabilities that uh, Aries, especially Akapai, uh, enables. Uh, so what I have now is an API, uh, which would be like a, call it an Aries traceability controller. Um, it's mostly designed to enhance traction. So it builds upon a traction tenant. Uh, but it's also compatible with Akapai with some minimal changes. Uh, so the goal for the presentation, well, is first of all, to just uh, disclose the work uh, that I've been working on and uh, showcase it, uh, showcase the alignment with Aries and 
what was not so much possible to do uh, for now uh, with Aries and maybe get some community feedback on what should be ported over versus what should stay uh, in a controller. And of course, I'll be demonstrating interoperability with the uh, Postman test suite from the traceability group. Um, so some of the key features of this work. So first of all, well, it's test suite compliant. So it's conformant and interoperable with the W3C credential community group traceability spec. So they have, they separate into uh, conformance testing. So they have this API spec that you can test conformance again. And then there's the interoperable uh, side of it, which is, can your platform communicate with other actors in the, the space? Um, it leveraged Aries where, pos where is possible. Um, so I had a lot of thought around what does this mean? And whatever action that needs to be ta taken, whether that's resolving a did or storing keys or so on, well, I, I would leverage the functionalities that are available in Akapai. And I've also done a minimal uh, usage of ASCAR for secure storage of uh, credentials and did documents and status list and so on, which I'm going to keep uh, improving. Um, a big one is the status list 2021 implementation. I wrote in revocation list 2020, but mostly uh, it's being moved over to status list 2021. There's also the bit string status list, uh, which is sort of the evolution for the VC data model 2.0. Uh, so the API takes into account the issuance management and verification of the credential status. And finally, DidWeb. So the, the spec relies on DidWeb. So the API sort of complements Akapai's uh, key storage method to assign a DidWeb to um, a key. Uh, and the API takes care of hosting the required documents so that you can actually use your DidWeb. Uh, so this is just a, a little list of uh, the, the problems we encountered. Some of them were like some minor PRs that were put in, some generally good improvement of various libraries. So the, the biggest issue, pending issue right now is there's a problem with one of the library. It's called PyLD. So it's a sort of JSON-LD parsing library written in Python. Uh, there's a problem when you have a specific combination of context and service and the did document. So this is under investigation at the moment. And the reason why this is a problem is because currently, um, it, with the new routes available in Akapai to verify a credential, when you provide your verification method and you use a did web, um, the software that goes fetch your verification, verification method is PyLD and it tries to uh, expand uh, and frames the, the document, but because of this bug, it's unable to get access to the key. So you need to just access it in some other way. So I'm kind of reflecting how this could be uh, maybe worked around. Uh, the, there was a small misalignment in the PyDid library with the did core spec regarding service types. So there was a small PR to address this and we had discussion and I think there's uh, going to be more improvement uh, for the PyDid library to do a bit more um, in-depth validation of the documents. Uh, issuing single type VC. So when you have a verifiable credential, you can have your, your type in there. Um, for iCapi, it forced the user to provide at least two types, uh, but in the spec, one type is perfectly fine. And most of the time when you have test suite, they will test with credential having one type. So we just remove this limitation so you can actually run test suites against, against it. Uh, re registering did web. So the, the, it was possible to register did web already in Akapai, but it nothing took care of uh, hosting the did document. So this API takes care of this. Uh, signing, verifying presentations. Uh, this will be something I, I will work on. So there, for, for those unaware, there's some new routes being added in Akapai for uh, signing verifiable credentials and presentation. At the moment, there's the, the verifiable credential routes, uh, but we need to add some work for the presentations, uh, both signing and verifying. Um, so for status management, uh, it's expected that the issuer will store all the credential it, it issues. 
so we can go fetch the information. So the API takes care of this uh, with the help of Ascar, like I mentioned, and managing uh, verifiable credential status through Statlosis 2021. And the final requirement was like a OAuth token requesting endpoint with the sort of expiry date on the token. So that, again, the API sort of uh, builds upon the multi-tenant uh, bearer token management of Akapai and just has it layer on top of it to manage uh, expiration date. So these were sort of the little problems that were uh, preventing the interoperability. Uh, so just a very Just a basic... matter of interest, um, Patrick, back to that yeah. high LD one. Um, yeah. Any any response on that one? Uh, no, there's a meeting. There should be the traceability meeting this afternoon. So I'll try to okay. see if someone awesome. can address it. But no, it's been the radio silent so far. That's crazy. Anyway, okay. Yeah, I, I, I under that. I'll link the PR, uh, I'll link the, the issue in the chat after the presentation. Uh, maybe someone can shed some light, but it's a very strange area. Yeah. Something about nullifying context and protected terms and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it's uh, pretty straightforward. So it's an API that you can stand up completely independent of a Akapai or traction tenant. So you would have your Akapai or you can even use it with the, the traction sandbox. So um, the, the project is open source. So you can just stand it up, you know, point it towards attraction and then you can sort of get into the flows with a tenant ID and an API key. Um, so the moment, obviously the, the solution has its own sort of Postgres storage. Uh, what gets stored in the Postgres is the documents and issued credentials. Those are the two main things. And there is some tenant information for the, the tokens and so on, some hash, uh, mostly for the expiration date. Um, and there's also the status list credential. So for those who don't know how status list 20, 2021 works, I'll give a short demo uh, later on. Uh, so the traceability API, yeah. So it's the component that really managed the verification of the status, uh, did web registration and management, uh, OAuth token request aspiration, and then obviously traction takes care of uh, credential presentation issuance. It can verify credentials. It cannot currently verify the credential status 2021. However, I, I do believe that this should be part of ICAPI. It should be not able to issue it, but to verify it. Uh, that's a core component of verifiable credentials and the token manager. It's also responsible. There's a sort of endpoint to resolve uh, this web, which gets leveraged here. Uh, all right, so I'll just do a quick demo. So they use a uh, Postman. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Postman, I'll do a little sort of explanation. It's pretty fantastic so far. I've uh, been using it even to, to just make tests for, I guess, just Akapai. It's been working really good. So you configure your environments. You know, you have your environment variable. So I have my traction tenant and my API key uh, that I provided. And then I stood up the solution at a design endpoint. Uh, and yeah, so I, I'm just going to run the conformance this suite. There's going to be uh, just a bunch of green check marks and stuff. And I'll go a bit over the results. Uh, and then I can get into a more sort of step by step demo for uh, the different features. And I'll explain the, the errors. So there's, there's a very high successful coverage with this. I think there's like two or three tests that kind of failed. Most of these tests for the conformance test suite, it's about validating the input that the API route receives. So um, for example, the credential issuance, you would receive a credential with uh, uh, options field of which um, signature suite to use. And then they will send you a bunch of negative tests, some positive tests, and you need to respond some specific error, record, uh, error codes, uh, depending on the, the test that's being run. Uh, yeah, so I'll just let this run to demonstrate this, and then we can get into the sort of the, the flow from registering a did, issuing credential, verifying, and explain a little bit the status list, how it works. 
Uh, and I can explain the, the few tests that fail. Uh, some of them, I, I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with the, what's the test expecting, but I'll let you judge for yourself. Is there any questions uh, so far? So what you're seeing, just to be clear, is a test suite defined by the W3C uh, traceability group um, that is conformance um, to, and this is basically the um, the, the core um, workers on this are the cohort of uh, DHS um, Silicon Valley Innovation uh, Fund people. Um, so it's the Transmutes and MavenNet and DHS uh, folks. So they they built this test suite. Um, Patrick has put together a client basically based on Akapai that runs the suite and as you see in runs it in all but two cases. I think there's two fails out of um, well, clearly more than 500 tests. Um, yeah, so that's, that's yeah. pretty significant. Um, really good to see and and you saw the work he had to do to get this to to work. So anyway, just providing that second repeat of, of a lot of what Patrick said. Yeah, uh, the spec, obviously like the this framework is mostly designed for supply chain, you know, uh, export and importation of goods uh, across uh, uh, boundaries. Uh, so the two tests that failed, uh, the first one here, um, on this. Uh, so the first one is, uh, actually fixed so that was in the PyDid library so it's the service type should be an array so according to the core spec here service type can be either a string or an array PyDid was expecting a string um, just because of the the work that was been done so we got a pull request in so this will be able to be changed as soon as uh, the, the new release of PyDid makes it into Akapai and I think the, the other test is uh a bit strange to me. So they, they want to be able to provide a proof creation date. So it expects me to have a proof dated 2006, which is a bit odd to me. Um, you know, I think the creation date of the proof should be when the, the signature was generated and applied. But uh, yeah, so I, I opened an issue on the traceability. I'm curious to get there. Uh, opinion on this. Um, so that's for the conformance test suite. The other ones are more based on different workflows and interoperability. Um, so I just wanted to show this sort of little custom, um, this little custom collection I, I did to test every feature sort of uh, independently. And why is it not opening? Close Postman and restart it. Not sure what happened there. All right, so you define, you know, you have your environment, you define your, your different variables that you want to use. Then you can access these variables in your what they call them collections. Which of these collection is like a call to? So you put your endpoint. Uh, then depending, you can have like post requests get all these different requests, and then you can either put in your body like a form or just put some raw JSON if you want to. So you would, for example, request a, a bearer token, and then you can actually save the sort of output of the request and uh, use it in subsequent calls. Uh, Postman is sort of being slow right now. So hopefully uh, I'll give it, I don't know, a few more. So there we go. So we have our, our response. Um, and this obviously is like the token that traction would generate from uh, uh, sort of the multi-tenancy aspect of it. 
so, so a few endpoints. So this is the endpoint that would respond to a did web resolve request. You know, so this is what the did documents looks like for now. Uh, there should be the traceability context, but because of the bug, I sort of omitted it. So I see we got our verification method. It used ED25519 verification key 2018. Um, and yeah, so each, each tenant gets its own sort of service endpoint uh, for the spec. Uh, and then I included three types of credentials you can issue. So just a simple credential. Um, so you have here your credential and then your option. So it's very, very, very similar to the new endpoints in Acapi. There's some slight differences that are important, uh, but it's very similar. So you can sort of issue this. So the API is really just a proxy to receive the response, how the spec accepts it, sends the payload to Akapai. Akapai does, signs it and returns it. And then you have your proof uh, added here. The, the API also sets a credential ID. So this is uh, crucial for um, status management. And then you can sort of verify it here. So we have the verification status, and then we can have a look at what a statusless credential would look like. So when you issue a credential that you want to have a status on it, you put in your options the, I think I should have added a, a purpose in there, but that, that's okay. Um, so you would have the type that you put and you would also put the, the purpose. Uh, if you want, for example, a re revocation or a suspension and how this looks when it's manifested is like so. So we have here the credential status. So we have the actual credential that's used here. So if we click on this link, this is a hosted credential. And the, the goal of this credential is to hold this encoded list. So the list is actually a VC itself. And every time that a credential gets revoked, one, so this list is actually a bit string of binary values and every credential, as we can see here, has a, an index in that list. So there's a, an algorithm that's well explained. So I think you just obviously base 64 encoded and then it's compressed. Um, so you would de-encode this list, decompress it, access the bit of the credential and verify if it's a zero or a one. And if it's a one, it means the credential is revoked. And then every time the issuer would change the status of a credential, he's gonna obviously modify this list and he's gonna reissue this credential and ho host it at the same endpoint. Um, so now if, if we verify this credential here, we have it verified. And then if we would wanna change the status. So I have the credential ID from the previous credential and I want to flip its status to a one. It's the demo effect, it's uh, taking a bit of time. Usually it's faster, so status updated. And when I want to verify it again, we say it's revoked. So now this credential that we just saw, um, it's been reissued with a new list and every credential has an ID on that list. And I can, of course, in a case of revocation, you wouldn't necessarily want to flip it back, but if it was a suspension, for example, you can sort of flip the bit back to zero and then the credential can be verified again. So these lists are managed by the issuer. Uh, the issuer can publish as many lists as they want. Uh, and then when they issue credential, these credentials get a unique index on that list. And the verifier is able to go fetch the list and verify the status based on that. Uh, the last thing, uh, so I'll just, revocation list, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna demonstrate the revocation is the, Exactly the same hey, principle. Patrick. Yeah. One quick thing. Um, okay, two quick things. Uh, one is the the status list credential is actually showing a 
um, the magic of compression when data is all the same, all zeros. Um, that encoded list string there is 120, uh, no, 16K of data. <laughs> it's a minimum, Min mini minimum of 16K of data. It can be more. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. if you um, decompress this, you'd get uh, 16K data. Um, but anyway, yeah. the other thing that I want to talk about, though, is um, we could absolutely combine the zero knowledge proof based. Um, mechanisms we're using where where the holder proves in zero knowledge without without giving the unique identifier um the uh the identi the identifier for the credential and mm -hmm. support status list 2021 in the same way by providing an endpoint that actually provides this uh, a credential with this encoded list in it so a an issuer could actually support both with the same data set um, so it's something um we we should probably be thinking about what i'm thinking about for a non-creds too and in particular yeah. the way it's got allosaur um it, it is absolutely could be supported this way and then the holder would be able to prove in okay. zero knowledge without sharing a unique identifier or could share the unique identifier and just let the verifier have at it to um you know get the unique identifier and look up the status list anyway just thought yeah. i'd throw that out there yeah, I think that that makes sense. I need to reflect on it to, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense. But uh, like I was saying earlier, I think definitely the the verification of the status list is something that Akapai should be able to do uh, for the sort of verifiable credential endpoints. Um, so this implementation I've made, I followed the spec. I didn't cross validate against other implementations. So if anyone here has a status list 2021 implementation, especially for revocation, uh, they could cross validate the worker. That would be very appreciated. Otherwise I'll reach to some other people uh, in the community. Um, so yeah, finally just signing a pre uh, presentation. So this is using the old JSON LD sign endpoints. Uh, at any moment now, it should provide a presentation with all three credentials. Um, of course, it didn't work. So uh, let me try. I think I did the wrong one. Yeah. So. Anyway, I'll have to see. There's something weird going on with Postman. It's being a bit, uh, a bit slow, and I don't know if the, the variables are saving properly. Um, but yeah, so that's for the demo, and I'll just quickly finish my presentation. So, for the next step, I have in mind. So, in the very short term, uh, I would like to get more familiar with the PyDate library and actually use it to not only validate documents but to create the did document and see a bit what is possible to do with this library. Uh, we had a bit of a discussion of updating to Pydentic 2.0. So maybe it's something I'll have a look. Uh, so Pydentic is a Python library to validate data. Uh, you can set up your sort of data classes and you can do validations against them. And version 2.0 brings a lot of interesting feature, but there's also a lot of breaking change. So. That's a maybe. Um, add presentation routes in Akapai. This is something I would like to add a look. So like I said, there's the verifiable credential issuance and verification. I would like to add um, verifiable presentation uh, issuance or signing and verify route. Um, interesting question about verify and maybe uh, I'll get opinions of people after is uh, if when you verify a presentation, should you also by default verify every credentials that it holds, or should you only verify the proof of the presentation? This is an interesting question to ask. Uh, status list 2021 verification in Akapai. Uh, review the process to retrieve did web verification keys. That's with the PyLD problem that was earlier. So in Akapai currently, it, it sort of frames the document. Uh, it's one way to do it. So I'm just want to sort of think what would be the 
the best solution short term and long term for addressing this issue. So I want to get to the bottom of the PILD problem. If there's no solution, uh, maybe it would be worth entertaining a conversation about getting did web verification keys in another way, such as just resolving the did document and going to fetch the ID. Uh, and another idea that I would like to bring is to add an optional time to live when you request a token and traction. So at the moment, it just generates you the token. It embeds the time at which the token was issued, uh, but it would be maybe interesting to add uh, um, the option for the user to generate a token that's only valid for 15 minutes, for example, or depending different use case. That's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there's any question, I'm more than happy to discuss it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we should probably move on because we've got one more presentation to come. Um, Lucas, is the time remaining going to be enough? I can do it in a pretty short amount of time if we want. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you, Patrick. Um, Lucas, you're up next. I'll leave it open for you to share and um, talk about a endorser service UI. Yeah, sure. Um, am I taking us to the end, or was there someone after me? I'll just no. Nope, you're okay. You could. You've got the full time. Okay. Um, screen one. Share. It's the uh, architecture diagram, or yeah, little sketch. Got it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, not a formal architecture diagram, more of a sketch. Um, so the endorser service UI, uh, want to strain, stress that it's the endorser service UI. So it's an interface built on top of the endorser service, not on top of a traction endorser or a ActPy endorser agent. Um, so I won't take time to go through what the endorser service is because that's already a Hyperledger uh, repo. Hopefully we have some base knowledge of what that is, um, but discuss that if anyone has any questions too. Um, so the, the endorser service UI, uh, technology-wise is a view, single page app, front end, um, a node back end, um, and um, it integrates with an OIDC provider. Um, now, uh, for our BCGov DITP endorser service setup um, in OpenShift, we have multiple endorser agent plus service or endorser service pairs or whatever we want to call it in a single namespace. So um, uh, the intent for where we'd be running this endorser service UI, at least the, the back end part that does serve the front end as well, uh, is inside that sh same namespace because the back end is what's going to have access to the uh, secrets that can uh, connect to the endorser service. Um, so, uh, the endorser service, uh, right here provides a way to get a token. So, um, you, you provide the username and password. So, uh, the backend can do that exchange to get that token and, and proxy calls, uh, to the endorser service. Um, so what's going to happen is the user is going to log in with the front end, um, and that's going to communicate everything in the back end. Um, the back end, you can set up uh, multiple of these endorser service um, connections, let's say, or not connections, but configuration. Um, maybe if you're only running one endorser, it doesn't matter, and you just have one username and password for the one. But for the DITP usage, we have dev test prod environments that have, you know, the sovereign candy, sovereign test, all in those pairs so we want the service to potentially be able or we want the ui to potentially be able to offer you the option of which one you want to connect to um this is just using node config so it's on the back end node app side so you'd inject this with environment variables however you need uh, or however you want to do in your deployment pattern just to get it into the container that's running the the node backend. So of course, since it's running in the same OpenShift namespace and we could use Helm to install, it would just have access to the secrets that the service is using to secure itself. Uh, but you could run that in some other cloud thing. You'd have to manually define the secrets. I don't know if you'd want to share the secrets across two places, but we wouldn't, I don't think, in the TITP use case. Um, 
Okay, so anyways, real quick, um, yeah, you do a typical OIDC redirect flow We're using the BC Gov SSO key cloak service for that, and the user gets a token, and that token is just your SSO token. That's not your endorser service token. You want to make that distinction? So this is how you interact with the front end, back end pair, and it back end verifies your SSO token to see if you're allowed to connect to this endorser. Um, so I'll show it in in use. Uh, this will look a lot like the traction tenant UI. If you've seen that, it is literally all the same framework, essentially same UI library. Um, so you go to the endorser service. I'm running this locally, so I've defined all those connections and stuff in secrets on my own. Um, select which endorser you want to connect to. You probably wouldn't have this if you were just using one endorser service. Uh, and also in DITP usage, we'd run three of these, one in each environment. So you wouldn't be mixing dev and test like I'm doing here, but this is just for my local testing. So I can log into B Sovereign Dev. Uh, I log in with my IDR, redirects me through my our OIDC provider. It's generic OIDC client, so you can set it up however is needed. Uh, I log in with my IDR, it redirects me back, gets a token, the other token, the endorser service token, and now I'm in. So I'm connected to the B Sovereign Dev Endorser service. Um, options here are I can check connections. Uh, here's my connections in the Endorser service, uh, active one. If there's a connection request, this provides an easy interface to accept or deny the connection um, using the Endorser service calls um, that accept or reject connections. Uh, you can go check more details about the connection here, I mean, row expander, mostly the same stuff as the tenant UI if you've used any of that interface, refresh table, et cetera. Um, oh, on existing connections, the, the important part for at least the stuff that I use it for uh, is if you have someone set that you wanna become, uh, or you wanna to allow to auto endorse transactions, you can go in here and uh, change the endorse status to auto endorse or auto reject or manual endorse. You can deactivate the connection if you need to. Um, not going to action any of these. Um, edit a connection, set the alias. Um, not actually showing the alias in the table, but maybe that would be a useful thing. Um, same list transactions. Um, so go see details about a transaction in the interface. Uh, the, there's an edit transaction in the service, but that's just a blank body. I don't think we'll actually leave that in. I noticed in the service, at least in the ones that we set up, none of the transactions created ats are filled in. They're all null, um, which kind of makes it trickier to track these transactions. So I'll look into that in the endorser service, maybe raise an issue. Uh, it's, it happens in Swagger too. It's not just happening in the front end. Um, so then the big, uh, the the, the next part I should show actually is, uh, so I've logged into B Sovereign Dev here, right? So I'm allowed to do that. Um, let's say I want to log into Candy Dev. Um, so I'm like an operational user supporting BC Gov's endorser service setups. You can say Lucas is allowed to log in and manage B Sovereign Dev, but he can't do Candy Dev. So if I try to log in with that, I don't have access to this endorser service. Um, I define that with simply now, like I said, it's it's generic OIDC adapter, but in key cloak, I've set up roles in our key cloak that says, look, Lucas is allowed to be an endorser of B sovereign dev. I'll add him to candy dev. And uh I got signed out of that. I'll add him to candy dev. Okay, that role is added, and now I should be able to go log in with my IDR. It was already SSO'd there, and now I'm looking at our handy dev. Uh oh, there's the demo thing. <laughs> um, that that works right before I did this. There you go. I don't know why. Um, so here's our candy dev connections. So easy to say this operational user who's maintaining this is yes or no allowed to manage that particular endorser service by adding the role. Um, the next part, oh, you can also check server configuration. Um, there's just an endpoint in 
swagger that or in the endorser service that returns that. Uh, but the next part, and I don't know if this audience has seen much of this new allowance things that were added to the endorser service. Um, that's something that I added, added by Gavin. We've only deployed this to be sovereign dev at this point, our endorser service for be sovereign dev. And this is something that allows you to specify dids, uh, schemas, and cred defs that, um, that are automatically endorsed. Uh, and so here's an interface to manage that, which I think is probably the most useful part, although the connection auto endorse setting is very useful for what we're doing. Um, so you have a list of dids, you can go and delete that did allowance if you really quickly operationally need to remove something that's become insecure, maybe. Um, you can add a new did here. Uh, I won't do that, but there you go. You'd add just add the did in there. Um, schemas. Here's the details that you set for allowed schemas. Credential definitions has a bunch more fields. Um, and then there's the config file upload, which again I'm not sure is new for this audience or not. Um, this is this is this part's proof of concept. I haven't even wired up any of this screen, but this is where you have CSV files, I believe it is, of um, lists of did schemas and cred defs that you'd want to uh, allow. And you can either append to existing configuration or overwrite all existing configuration. This is the one where we want to flash you a million warnings before you set that. Um, yeah, that's a really quick walk through the UI. Um, yeah, I see Patrick has his hand up. Yeah, just a quick question regarding the allow of Shimmer and credential definition. So you can actually say you're only allowed to request this schema on this endorser service. Is that what I'm understanding? The allowance is, and I'm actually not as familiar with it as maybe some other people on this call, so speak up if I'm wrong. The allowance for a schema is you specify this schema, yeah. and it says that someone posting a transaction based on that schema is automatically endorsed by this ledger. So someone okay. doesn't have to go and manually endorse the transaction. Okay, um, yeah, that, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Which you normally would on this screen finding, are you sure you want to accept or reject the transaction? Awesome, awesome. cool. Yeah, it's that granularity level below setting the connection to auto endorse or the whole endorser itself to auto endorse because you can, like we have one set up that just, the one that the sandbox environment that you were uh, discussing just uh, endorses everything. Yeah, 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 I'm familiar with the, you You can, so you have like the startup parameter, but also like when you create the connection, you can mm -hmm. set per request if it's auto or not. So this is sort of what it's doing. Yeah, and this allows us to, I believe, the goal is to precede it with these config files so that we say in this business area, anything they're going to do gets auto endorsed. Someone doesn't have to operationally come in and manage the connection when they make it um, or multiple business areas using the same credential maybe. Um, yeah. But yeah, I won't, I won't speak too much on that because that, that part I'm not actually as familiar with our plans for. Uh, so something else that uh, came up. So you had mentioned at one point regarding when you were, you had your uh, architecture diagram, uh, you mentioned something about the secrets and the uh, WT token, um, like the service secret. Um, can you elaborate a bit more, like what was what benefit you would have had if you had access to those secrets? Yeah. So these secrets are the ones that stay. I'm allowed to get a token from the endorser service, right? So I could go yeah. into the swagger and get a token and start doing my work or bad right. stuff if I got that secret. Yeah. Um, so in order for the the front end app to go make those calls, the back end app is gonna the back end side is gonna get that same token using that secret um, to make the call to, and then the tokens but used I, to make the calls to fetch connections. So this JWT. Yeah. The different JWT is the one that is just on the OIDC side to when I log in that has my role to say, the back end's going to check that JWT to say, yes, you're allowed to be doing this call for candy dev yeah. and I will access the secrets on your behalf. Yeah. But not return that, not return that secret client side, obviously. Yeah. Interesting. Because I had also like some, uh, when I was doing the OAuth part, uh, Obviously, I started with setting up my own Akapai agent and multi-tenant, and mm -hmm. you know, it's 
something you would want your application to be able to decode the token to verify that those access rights, you know, and then when I switched mm -hmm. to traction, I had to figure out, okay, well, you know, I don't have access to that information. So how can I mm -hmm. sort of follow the token and like who's accessing the platform? So, uh, yeah, that, yes. that definitely key cloaks a, a powerful tool for that. Uh, I didn't get deployed a key cloak for my use case, but uh, yeah, Emiliano and I have discussed for traction this same sort of OIDC type layer. Right now, you you showed using API keys, right? And those are not user based, right? That's yeah, you know, you don't have any identity behind that. So could we have the like this is sort of a kind of a start of that layer that we could. Include yeah, because me, yeah, I was interested in like, um, you know, how in your sub wallet you can register did, and one feature that I wanted to have is to have a API key bound to a specific did, you know, so we mm. like an API key that could get a token to sign credential with a specific mm. did. But anyway, yeah, that's all. It's definitely uh, the, the tokens are there's could be reflected how it could be made the. Uh, improved mm -hmm. um yeah so i'll just i'll i'll leave it quickly at that um none of this is in the hyperledger repo for the endorser service or anything that's just the personal repo i've got going um it needs some more cleanup and improvement and we discuss sharing it after that um but see we're pretty much at time but if there's any other quick question or follow-up i'll leave it to the group that was awesome Looks good. Thanks. Nice work. Any other questions? All right, well, that wraps it up. Again, a reminder that at the next meeting, we'll talk Akapai Roadmap um, and definitely would welcome people's input on uh, and organization's input on what they wanna see happening in Akapai in the next while. So that's for two weeks from now. Any other topics? And if other people have presentations or things they would like to show off, please let me know. I'm happy to put you on the schedule for that as well. With that, we're wrapped up. Take care, all. Have a great day. Fantastic. Thanks, Patrick and Lucas. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.